and in some other participants might join later. Our webinar will be recorded. If there are any objections on your part, you can have your camera off, but I think that this recording will be useful and beneficial for everyone because we will publish it on our website. Greetings, everyone. Once again, my name is Mirab Labadze. During this specific webinar, I will be serving as your host. I am a regional project coordinator of the European Training Foundation. And this is a project implemented within a beautiful initiative entitled Creating New Learning. And within this initiative, we intend to create a community of innovative educators. And since last year, within the framework of this initiative, we have conducted multiple regional webinars and meetings. You will hear more from Fabio about this community, about this fantastic initiative. The webinar will last for about one and a half hours. And pay attention to the fact that we are having simultaneous interpretation into Russian and English, but we have representatives from six countries that are part of the Eastern Partnership Program. Uh, thank you, everyone who joined, who signed up. Uh, we have many more participants who signed up. So hopefully they will join a little bit later. If possible, please introduce yourselves in the chat because we are too many to have a round of oral introductions. We have four presentations planned. My intro, then a short intro from Fabio. And our intro presentations will be followed by four presentations and then a Q&A session an open discussion, one and a half hours, maybe a little bit longer, depending on how active you are. We have a chat function. You can ask your questions in the chat as well. After all the presentations, you will also have an opportunity to voice any questions or comments that you might have. Should you have any interesting and stimulating thoughts, or maybe you want to briefly share your experience, you will also have that opportunity. So maybe you are already actively applying robotics and 3D printing in education. So we will do our best to provide you with that opportunity at the very end of the webinar. So thank you very much indeed. And I want to give the floor to Mr. Fabio Nashimbeni from the European Training Foundation. And he will briefly tell us uh, about this initiative of creating a community of innovative educators. Not only is it being implemented in our region, but it also encompasses all the countries uh, that are adjacent to Europe. Fabio, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Merab. And uh, I will give this three minutes introduction from my side in English. So please uh, use uh, the interpretation button in the bottom if needed. Uh, I'm Fabio Nascimbeni. I'm uh, leading the work of the community of innovative educators within the ETF. And um, I'm very pleased to see so many people in this first webinar of the year of uh, the community. The, this, um, this webinar actually is a, a perfect example of what the community wants to do. So we, we want to discuss uh, and to learn from each other about new things, about new approaches, and actually robotics and 3D uh, is exactly one of the issues we are looking at, like many others. We want educators and practitioners to exchange, so feel free during the call not only to listen, but also to put your questions in the chat and to let us know if you want to know more or if you want to be more engaged in the future. And finally, it is a multinational community. So at the moment, we are mostly targeting with this, uh, with this webinar, the Eastern Partnership uh, region, but actually <clears throat> we have also, I see also some known face from uh, other regions uh, that the ETF is working with. So it's great to see already this uh, very interesting I would say cross-fertilization among, among regions. Now, the community started in uh, the beginning of September last year, and uh, we reached uh, in a bit more than four months, more than 800 registered participants, which is, uh, we believe, uh, a sign of the importance for you, for educators, for practitioners, for researchers, 
to work uh, on uh, innovative teaching and learning approaches and ideas. And we are very happy about this. And during this year, we plan uh, to keep on uh, uh, organizing activities like this, uh, supporting discussions, but also valorizing what is happening in the different national environments. So we are talking to a number of ministries and other stakeholders to understand uh, what we can do together. And we will uh, organize in the second part of this year a, an international competition, a light competition to allow the most interesting practices to emerge. So in case uh, you, you believe you are doing something very interesting and innovative, or you know some uh, colleague who are doing so, feel free to come to us and to, to let us know. I just wanted to share for a second the uh, sc my screen to show you the web page of the community. I hope you can see it now. This is uh, the web page on open space, which is uh, the, the actually the collaborative space supported by the ETF. And here you see that in this page, you, you find everything that you need to you need to know about the community. You, first of all, uh, you can join the community by registering to open space through this link here. You can see what the community has been doing in 2021. So it, we organized a number of webinars, as you can see there during the last months of last year. Feel free to browse them. We have all the recordings in English and in Russian, some of them in Arabic. We try to to, to cover as many as many languages as possible, and also all the blog posts uh, that you might be interested in. Now, I suggest if you want to, to be uh, in touch with us and be a part of this community, you, 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 you register and you will be kept informed about the new, the upcoming event and uh, the upcoming activities. Now, I know the agenda is very, uh, interesting and very lively and I've seen the profiles of the speakers so I'm uh, super interested and curious uh, to hear about these uh, new practices so I will just wish you a very fruitful and uh, engaging webinar and give back the floor to my friend Merab. Thank you. Marab, I think you're muted. Sorry for that. You can see my screen, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, like, just a brief inter introduction to the topic and to the to the speakers. Um, why robotics and 3D printing? They are both uh, relatively new topics. Well, robotics you can find in the science fiction for quite a while, but uh, 3D printing is relatively new. So you can probably see some overlapping uh, with both topics. Uh, and uh, recently they are both very popular with a big following. Um, so what was uh, before the pandemic, I would say, which is considered a threshold? Uh, it was like parallel but occasionally overlapping development of robotics and 3D printing and education. Um, our presenters today will talk from their experiences and trying also to present how they can uh, mature co-develop, but uh, separately they are also very interesting topics for 3D printing and education. They're emerging and what's the most important, they have the genuine following. Um, and mostly, currently I would say that it's um, mostly in informal education, but there are also efforts uh, from either the government or to, from the enthusiasts to um, pave its way to the formal education settings or for some blending settings. What was um, the reason why 3D printing is becoming most popular? Mostly it's becoming uh, relatively recently, it has become cheap. So it's really cheap to um, purchase uh, a 3D printer, even from China. One stands to the right from me. I'll not now not switch now my camera, but um, in the office, just uh, I use it for training, or it's really not not too expensive. Um, so it was mostly step by step and not an revolutionary adoption in formal education settings. That again, uh, as I said, there is a network of enthusiasts both in robotics. Uh, there are informal clubs, um, private schools, uh, and lots of contests there and there is a maker movement 
um, that includes also 3D printing uh, maker movement. It's, it's a little bit larger, but still it's uh, 3D printing um, matches it very well. So use uh, 3D printing in different activities and designing uh, tool things and educational in educational settings as well. Uh, so finally, uh, more holistic approach is also present. Well, there are fab fab fabrication laboratories, fab labs. There is a fab lab network uh, that uh, who, sp who spots these fab labs all over the world. In Georgia, there was also an initiative led by Georgia Innovation Technology Agency to introduce fabric well, to um, start fabrication laboratories in uh, TVET institutions uh, in vocational education training and also in other institutions uh, within the formal education system. Uh, also, there are STEM labs, and we shall have a presentation later today from Armenia about this approach, which um, actually is a kind of state response and government response and to make this more systemic. So uh, who are our speakers? The first speaker is Yuri Ulyanitsky, coach, mentor, teacher of robotics from uh, Ukraine and he will talk about educational sports robotics in Ukraine. Then uh, Levanko Patadze is International Relations Development Manager in Vet College Model City, Georgia. Um, it's the application of 3D printing in the vocation education uh, and training system. Uh, the, the next speaker is Shamam Gevorkian, Education Director at Armath Engineering Laboratories, Armenia. She will introduce um, Armath Labs and its activities in STEM, including robotics and uh, 3D printing. And finally, uh, Ksana Zadarozhna, a professor of the Department of Physical and Mathematical Sciences, Flight Academy of National Aviation University in Ukraine. And she will talk about aviation robotic systems in the context of higher education. So the logic is that we start with a mostly a primary school or like early education oriented um, applications. Then we uh, continue with a vocational education training. Uh, then our map is mostly for the secondary school. And finally, we arrive into the higher education institution. Uh, of course, so there are many more projects across the region, but uh, again, you can also, in, in addition to presenting yourself in the chat, if you, uh, if you would like to um, send us some links to the, your activities or your pages or interesting initiatives you are involved in and you are doing, uh, please do so. Please put the links to the chat and we'll shall either discuss them now or maybe later because the community of innovative educators is expanding, it's seeking the innovation and uh, uh, we hope that it will become for you also a platform to broadcast your experiences and to innovate more with your colleagues. Um, finally, I'll just, I put some questions after a very short brainstorming, um, which could be answered by the speakers and maybe later on. So what resources are needed, including the human and material resources? Is technological infrastructure sufficient for in, uh, developing 3D printing and um, um, robotics in education? Uh, where do teachers you know, usually struggle, where they find the challenges and how to help them? Uh, is it possible? I mean, is, it's challenging to do it uh, in the pandemic, but is it still possible? Uh, what are the pathways to better integration in formal education? How can businesses help uh, and how to evaluate the success? Um, maybe uh, these two trends uh, will continue separate development or maybe we can find into corrections. And of course, your questions are very welcome. Thank you for your attention. Uh, now I'll give the floor to our first speaker, Yuri Ulyanitsky. Пожалуйста, Yuri. Greetings, friends and colleagues. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes, everything is fine. Just a minute. I will have my presentation on the screen. Can you see it? Is everything fine? Yes. Fantastic. Uh, greetings once again. Thank you, Marab, for the invitation. I would like to tell you briefly about uh, school robotics in Ukraine. So I will focus on public schools, uh, clubs, and also some private institutions and contests. For me, robotics is 100% STEM. It's not even STEM, but STEAM 
education because uh, the design of a robot matters a lot. It's about science, physics, chemistry, analysis, research. Uh, technology is about uh, sensor operation, IT technology and programming. Engineering is about design and construction. Uh, the design of a robot is an important element. Uh, the creative perception is there as well. Math is an important component, uh, mathematical formulas and calculations. So for me, this is the essence of robotics. Not the teacher is the centerpiece, but the project itself and the practical task that you give your students. Do we need to introduce robotics into the school system? My answer is yes, and it's been like that for a long time. Um, information studies uh, um, are about programming, while robotics is something different. The task of robotics is to show children how they can learn for the future. Electronics, uh, mechanical components, uh, sensors. A robotics professional knows how all these systems and mechanisms operate. So basically, he's a mediator between artificial intelligence and human beings, like this vacuum cleaner robot. It's a great example. I want my kid to see a number of um, engine, engines and sensors and control systems there. We don't want our kids to think that it's magic. On this slide, you can see examples of robots that already work for people. So robots are used at large production facilities, uh, vacuum cleaning robots, um, educational robots. There are multiple technologies that are being actively integrated into our life. Robots are used for delivery. Uh, there are multiple uh, robotic systems and mechanisms in agriculture and every business. There are also robots that can help kids master new skills and develop. Everything is very simple. Children have to know how these systems operate and how to operate them. In the future, I'm sure that we will have robotic uh, uh, bees um, or some other creatures and children should not be fearful of them. They have to understand how these systems and robots operate. Formal education in Ukraine. Um, it's about public schools for about three to five years, some schools have introduced a course in robotics, but it's not a separate standalone discipline. It's like a component of information studies. Uh, some public and private grants are in place for creating STEM labs. So robotics is a big trend right now. And the focus is on solutions that do not really require that much equipment and robots. Like, for example, you can see Lego constructors like Mindstar. You can see a new platform called Roba Roba. There are some hard and fast projects on multiple other platforms. What are the pros? So this process is already ongoing. People are developing programs. They are organizing workshops and webinars. So there's an entire community of enthusiasts in this area. But people are very passionate about this craft and they contribute to, to the progress. But the con is that we don't really have a load for a robotics teacher in our school system. Those people who try to use elements of robotics do not always understand what the essence is. But I think that the situation is changing for the better. The situation is much better in terms of funding. We have formally approved curricula and educational programs by the Ministry of Education and Science. Another problem is that we have multiple items on the market that are not necessary for kids. I have experience of working with one school and at that school, they procured a large number of fantastic robots, but they had no clue why they needed them. They didn't really have the relevant professionals. They didn't even have the right table to operate uh, those robots. I will not really go into the details right now. You unfortunately, um, we cannot see your slide. I mean, we can see the presentation, but we can see slide one. Are you still on slide one? They haven't changed? No, unfortunately, the slides are not changing because we can still see slide one on the screen. 
just a second because I'm on slide four. That's what I see on my screen. Can you see the second slide? Nope, we can still see the same slide, still slide one. Maybe you can stop screen sharing and give it another try, but please switch to a full screen mode. That might help. Let me give it another try. What about now? Marab, I cannot hear you. It's not a full screen mode. We can see slide two. Nope, still slide two. I might be having some issues with my internet connection. Try switching to a full screen mode. I mean, if you can see my presentation, then everything is fine. Maybe I'm having some internet connection issues because this file is quite voluminous. So you should be able to see me right now, right? We can see you. Yet another try. Can you switch to a full screen mode, a slideshow? That should help. Just a second. Everything is working now. Yes. All right. Perfect. Thank you. So this slide was about formal education and public schools. The next one is uh, informal education, or sometimes they call it non-formal education. It's about uh, workspaces for kids, uh, public clubs, uh, and it's something slightly different. If a kid goes to a public club, then you can try some more interesting and complex projects with them. So maybe more electronics. Uh, you can have uh, more contests and competitions. You can train them in various programming languages, uh, plus C, Python. But I think the advantages and the disadvantages of informal education are the same as for public school. But uh, one of the greatest problem is funding. It's basically not there in Ukraine. I will elaborate on that a little bit more later. So a lot is done by teachers and educators themselves. For upwards of 10 years, I worked in a state-owned center. It's the former station of young technicians. Uh, it's a regional institution, but unfortunately, a lot of such institutions are being closed down right now because they are not really supported by the government. We can use some Lego platforms. Uh, we don't really have to stick to the formal curriculum. We can create and invent robots that children are interested in. So children can do their own research. They can design their own mechanisms. We go to competitions and contests. We explore new platforms for designing and creating robots. And a couple of words about the third component, which is private education in Ukraine. Private education is about uh, private clubs, IT academies. It's a completely different dimension. It's a completely different level. Kids there are exposed to the latest, to the brand new, but there are two major problems. Um, a lot of um, advertising and income generation. A lot of people do that because they want to make money on that. And the other problem is a shortage of professionals because most professionals want to have the same salaries as um, at Facebook. I used to work at one school and this school really wanted to incorporate robotics into their um, learning process. Uh, I also worked as the leader of one club um, at a public center. 
Um, now I'm working at a private center. Uh, four years ago, I set up a robotics club. And this year, uh, this club was incorporated into an academy. Why so? My first training kit took more than one year to get here. So it was one kit for the entire class and I had to purchase a tablet at my own expense. Then I started participating in training sessions, uh, workshops uh, and conferences. And I realized that public schools will not be able to move with the times and progress at my pace because uh, robotics is developing too fast. Drones are a great example. They are already flying over the fields. They are used to make uh, satellite images. Uh, they rescue people in the mountains. So this is something that is already a part and parcel of our life. I cannot really wait for two years to get some funding in a public school because in two years, something new will appear. Maybe in two years, robots will start to swimming or moving underground. My point is that we need to move with the times when we're talking about robotics. And that's why I decided to transition to the private sector. In a private institution, you have many more windows of opportunity. And since the focus uh, of our webinar is on integration in schools. I would like to provide some recommendations for teachers, particularly those that are new to this field. The first recommendation is introduction of atypical courses. I would like to demonstrate one example. I remember that I had to work with kids from the first through the fourth grade. I had only one training kit, one platform. I had only two sensors, one engine, one smart hub, and I could not really use this kit for all four grades, all four classes. What did I do? I designed a very short course. So we created joysticks, uh, AVR steering wheel, that's what we designed. Uh, we programmed a simulator, an aviation simulator, together with our kids. And this kid could be behind the steering wheel. It was very stimulating and engaging for children. And I think that it was an out of the box solution. So my point is that teachers should try to introduce some atypical and out of the box courses. The second recommendation is game form of education. Robotics is often about moving one item from point A to point B. Like, for example, we have a, a bottle of water and we want to move it from point A to point B. But I do something completely different. I tell kids, you all love ice cream, right? So let's create this large, beautiful fridge with ice cream and you need to deliver it to school. How are we going to do that? Uh, we need a robot to uh, come pick it up, deliver it, right? Because you love ice cream, don't you? So my point is that you have to use some game forms, not just delivering from point A to point B. You have to create an entire concept or entire game around it. The next bullet point is competitions for children. I think uh, it's an obvious one because the kids always want to be better than others. They want to excel. They want their robot to be first or they want their robot to deliver the heaviest load or they want their mechanism to be the greatest. So you need to organize some sort of competitions for children on a regular basis, not maybe during each and every class, but at least once a month to invigorate and lift their spirits a little bit. Creative and active tasks during lessons. I think it's a very important one. You need to interest children through a tangible, real project. Some people have um, cards um, and um, processors. Uh, they have uh, monitors, uh, but do not implement boring and tedious projects. Uh, create something 
fun, something new, create a power station or a thermometer um, or maybe a sensor-operated lighting and let kids run around the streets, measure temperature, wind speed or wind direction, you can give them some paper and a pen and they can document solar temperature or maybe they can um, document temperature in the sun, in the shade. This is something that will definitely engage and stimulate children or maybe um, convert it into fitness. So make them hop around or jump around uh, until they achieve a thousand steps. Adults are a different thing, but kids feel often bored um, in the classroom because usually they receive the correct, not correct information. And they sort of feel that there are some frames that they cannot push. So you need to push the envelope. You need to push the boundaries a, a little bit. So my next recommendation is that there's no correct or wrong. It's about STEM ed education. It's all about exploration, self-exploration and self-discovery. So kids need to make some mistakes and um, learn something through test and trial. So once again, it's all about kids learning for themselves what the best solution is. There's another recommendation, emotional approach to teaching and feedback from the teacher. You should be taken by surprise. Wow, this is a fantastic idea. Have you ever seen the eyes of a pupil when you tell them, legit, cool, great job. You see this sparkle, you see this fire in the eyes of kids then. And this is something that will definitely motivate them for the future. So teachers have to motivate. And by motivation, I mean real tangible motivation via competitions and contests. Do not just say, you know what, when you grow up, you will become um, a master of your craft. Um, you can even say something along the lines of, you know what, you, you will go to a contest, you will present your robot there, and everyone will think that um, you are legit. So do not really talk to kids about what might come in 30 years or in 40 years. You need to tell them what they can expect here and now. Teacher tricks, what do I mean by that? Uh, this is something very peculiar that I apply, what do I do? I work with kids aged 8, 10, and then 10, 12. When we create robots with small kids, they want to participate in contests and competitions. So what do I do? We put together a robot and children start competing, but there's always an outsider. So there's always a kid whose robot will be very slow. So I quietly approach the student and I tell him or her, you know what, I will help you, but I will do it very covertly. And uh, I will help you improve the mechanism of your robot and your robot will accelerate. So I help this kid while other kids do not see that. And then this kid approaches the table for robotics and uh, launches um, his or her robot in this robot uh, arrives first and then kids start asking how did you do that uh, how come so they do not run to me to ask uh, what happened they start interrogating this very kid so basically you can use kids themselves for learning and teaching or you can do some tricks with a robot to make it move faster so my point is that through such tricks, you can interest kids better and you can accelerate their learning process. And the last recommendation is the interesting tasks. Uh, I think I have already mentioned multiple times that kids have to be motivated and interested. I didn't really time my presentation, so I really hope that I'm not taking too much time, but this is the last slide that I have robotics competitions in Ukraine. We already have a wide array of competitions in Ukraine at municipal level, at district level. We even have some nationwide robotics competitions. But I would like to briefly elucidate those competitions that are well known globally. So these are international competitions like MakeX, 
Here you can see a photograph uh, um, on the slide. I love the platform MEX. I relish their competition. It's not just about Lego. It targets uh, children aged 10 to 12, and this competition is uh, insightful and stimulating indeed. Um, I am a Ukrainian judge uh, within the Make X Ukraine competition. Uh, I saw those kids. I saw their projects firsthand. I was a witness to the sparkle and fire that they have in their eyes, and it's fantastic. WRO competition. So these are large scale um, Lego based platforms in competitions. Well, this competition is interesting, but I think uh, I have already outgrown those shoes. It's interesting, but I'm not really sure that we need to continue progressing towards uh, Lego robotics, because I think that it's already a thing of the past. And there's uh, another interesting platform from Korean producers called Robo Robo. In 2021, we held a very interesting all-Ukrainian Olympiad or competition called Robo Robo Olympiad. Yuri's connection is intermittent, so I cannot hear everything. So this last competition is very engaging. Children got to create uh, their own vacuum cleaning robots uh, or some other household robots. It was stimulating, um, it was um, engaging, and I really relished in the moment. So these are just some examples of platforms and competitions that are conducted not only in Ukraine, but worldwide. I'm also cooperating with the DJI education representatives. Uh, they have a great competition in robotics. The Ukrainian team participated, uh, I think, they won the second or the third prize. But they also announced a drone competition, DJI Tela Indu. Um, so they're going to use some drones and similar technologies. And it's very interesting. So a closed space, a drone has to fly from one side, then fly across the maze and then fly out from a different side. So this is something that I really want to introduce to in my academy. We are waiting for the announcement and we will definitely give it a try. I think that's it on my part. Thank you very much for this insightful presentation. Um, I think that uh, our participants uh, gleaned some useful information. But uh, I have a question. Let's assume that we have a public school. It's not a private school. It's not that resourceful. Uh, can you create a sort of club in this school uh, with elements of robotics? So how can we promote robotics uh, in public education, for example? I think it's possible. Uh, I think, first and foremost, it takes an interested person. So there has to be a driving force behind it. There has to be a motivator behind this process. So if there is a person, if there is a teacher that wants to develop this trend, um, a teacher who is ready to um, teach children and take them to competitions, it's all possible. It's not as scary as it, as it might seem. Thank you. If you have any other questions, you can write them down in the chat, but I think we are a little bit behind the schedule. Thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, maybe you can post the links to all the competitions that you mentioned in the chat and uh, also a link to your Facebook page. Thank you, thank you for your attention.
на ссылку, и там в слайду четыре варианта ответа на вопрос, если у вас их будут использования. Please participate in the poll about your experience. Click on the link, answer the question, and then we will see what the result is. The next speaker is Levan Kupatadze. Uh, thank you, Yuri, for this great presentation. To having us um, with my FabLab manager here. I represent College Modusi. I'm going to show you the presentation now. Um, so, hope you see the presentation. Maybe it's better to make it full screen. Yes. Let me help. <laughs> full screen. Thanks. Is it full screen now? Uh, no. But you click on the button, is a presentation and, and above. Yeah. Yeah. I can see. Yeah, thank you. So it's 3D printing in. So this is 3D printing in uh, wet uh, vocational education and training. 3D printing allows students to design rich learning experience for deep theoretical constructs that bring learning from computer screens into students' hands. Digital 3D world, worlds come to life with 3D printers, can encourage sharing, teamwork, planning, design, and thinking through ideas. We, we actively use the benefits of 3D printer in various teaching fields at our college. It was a new and great challenge for us, and it was successfully introduced in different fields. In this presentation, I want to show you the benefits that a 3D printer brings to our college cognitive life. Um, these are the flexible fabrics printed on a 3D printer that was used uh, as a dress details printed on 3D printer. And uh, uh, once happened that college students had the show of the production. And innovation technologies, simulators demonstrate FabLab's capabilities for both of our students and visitors. These are the, also, uh, we have a differential simulator for the vehicle printed with 3D printer. Uh, I don't know if you know, but our college has programs um, like uh, vehicle, uh, undercarriage, uh, undercarriage vehicle uh, fixing and repairing. And before they touch the details of the vehicle, they see it through this 3D printer printed details. Let's say part of the vehicle generator printed with a 3D printer. And here is a sample of it. Also, there is an automotive differential transmission shaft and brake pads created by 3D printer. And here are some details. And it's all created in our college. Also, uh, these are the mini models of the wind turbines that run on solar energy, and which was also created here in our college. These are some details created through the 3D printer. Those you see, the parts. Um, as uh, Yuri mentioned, the robots here is a robot prototype also created in 3D printer. Uh, so next time maybe we can collaborate and create from between our 
institutions, maybe we're going to create something together. And at the last, these were the benefits uh, that uh, uh, in our college successfully using. Uh, we'll take the deeper interest in the future uh, to popularize it among, to, uh, among our students. And thanks for the attention. It was a short presentation, what we do here in our college. Thank you, Levi. Uh, <clears throat> I have a question. Uh, what programs, uh, the part that you mentioned are taught in your college? And uh, which of them use 3D printing in this educational process mostly? Yes, so we have sewing program, we have um, uh, vehicle undercarriage fixing, repairing uh, programs, and we are uh, very uh, deeply uh, providing this 3D printer for these programs to create the stuffs and to, for the help of 3D printer, we are creating the stuff for this. And we are teaching also our students, um, and which is very innovative and which is very unique nowadays to us. Mm -hmm. um, do you cooperate with some industry from with companies in the work based learning? Are you engaged or not? Yes, that's our future goal. We are yeah. planning to be an entrepreneurial college. Mm -hmm. And if it happens for sure, we're going to provide, uh, we're going to create and uh, through this entrepreneurship in the future. And okay. our main goal is that, and hopefully it happens end of this year. Okay. Thanks so much. I was impressed. I haven't, I didn't have a chance to see this 3D printing dress, but I know that the EU representative uh, also has seen it and that he was, it was impressed. Huge popular actually. And a lot of people attended that show and yeah. They also wrote in the papers, and a lot of people were talking in our city, especially. Yeah, so you got public publicity with that, so now you'll get more publicity. Maybe with one main thing I want to tell you that our fab lab is um, ahead of the other fab labs in Georgia, and our college fab lab is the biggest in vocational education centers in Georgia, and that's why, like. Uh, Everything is creating the innovative stuff here, and thanks for it. And okay, thanks. thank you very much, Levan. Um, uh, I can see some comments in the chat. But before we are exposed to a presentation from Armenia, I would like to briefly demonstrate the results of our poll. Hopefully you can see the results we can see that most of our participants are experienced. So um, about 53% have experience with robotics and 3D printing ed education. 16% uh, yes with 3D printing, 16 yes with both. As we can see, there is an avid interest in these topics from our audience. And I really hope that during this webinar, you will all um, garner some um, nuggets of wisdom. And now I want to keep the floor to our Armenian colleagues and we will hear about uh, Armath Engineering Labs. Shamam, the floor is yours. Shamam is here, I can see her in the participants list. Shaman, can you hear us? Yeah. Oh, yeah, we can't hear you yet. Um, no. So maybe it's with the Zoom settings, it's using something else. There was some scratch sound. You can talk, try to talk now, no? So meanwhile, please, uh, пожалуйста, присылайте свои вопросы, комментарии в чат. 
Uh, Can you hear me well? In the meantime, please post your questions or comments in the chat. For this technical issue. <laughs> First of all, let me thank you for this great opportunity. It is really very, very exciting because uh, in this, especially during the COVID time, we're not gathering so fast, like uh, talking about these important topics and sharing our experiences. So it is quite, quite important for us uh, to introduce Armat and what we do and how can we co collaborate uh, in the future. So first of all, let me share with you a video which tells um, about Armat achievements during the last year. Um, may I share, uh, have I the permission? Yes, I do. Can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. And can you hear the voice? Uh, not so much, but it's usual. So okay. with those different channel transmit the voice. Okay, thanks for watching. Uh, this was mainly about uh, last year achievements. And to be honest, uh, 50 minutes is so little to introduce Armat. You hear me well, right? Yes, yes. Good. Um, however, I will try to uh, fit in this 15 minutes. Uh, and later on, if you have questions, I'm ready to uh to answer so um armat engineering laboratories it's the uh, one of the biggest projects of uate union of advanced technology enterprise enterprises it's a non-governmental non-profit entity of it and high-tech companies operating in armenia uat is the biggest uh, it uh, association in armenia having 127 uh, members in it, which uh, give this membership phase for uh, ARMAT laboratories, which are used in ARMAT laboratories and in different educational programs of UAT. And the mission of UAT is to place the Armenia on the world map of the international high-tech market. And it supports a favorable business environment, organizes events and implements lobbying and development projects. As I mentioned, ARMAT is one of uh, the educational programs of UAT, but the biggest one. 
So engineering, uh, ARMAT uh, provides engineering program for children of ages from 10 to 18. The project implementation and development of the methodology handled by UAT. So the methodology has been developed, is, was developed uh, by the members of UAT. It is like uh, totally made in Armenia. And in Armat Engineering Laboratories, kids aged to, from eight to 18 are introduced to science, technology, engineering, and math education through interactive after-school classes, exciting competitions, innovative camps, and more. So Armat is non-formal, is providing non-formal education to kids. Uh, it is not included in the uh, mandatory curriculum of uh, state uh, um, schools. So the mission of ARMAT is to empower younger generation with skills and mindset for the economy of the future by encouraging and unlocking engineering and creativity talent. Uh, we aimed from the beginning to reach out to the each and every child in uh, especially rural, rural regions of Armenia. So uh, we used to say that Armat goes to children, but not children go uh, to uh, just the center to, have, to get this into uh, education. As you have uh, seen in the video, we have more than 600 already. It is just an obsolete number. Uh, currently, we're having 600 20 labs across Armenia, Georgia, and India, and one is uh, is going to be opened in Bangladesh, across with all of the negotiations what, that we are doing with uh, different countries, and more than already 60,200 children are um, benefiting from the project, again, in our Armenia and in Georgia, in, in India, uh, Artsakh as well. Um, so what is the program? What are those pro uh, program objectives? First of all, support technological sector growth, advertise the IT profession uh, in rural areas, promote the entrepreneurial culture, innovative and engineering mindset, constantly improve technological education curriculum, del deliver equal education opportunities, regional development, whole territory of the country. Oops. Sorry, uh, and creation of creation and strengthening of the uh, bond between the school system, labor market, and the universities. Program concept, uh, engineering club laboratories for after-school classes, accessibility for anyone at age 10 to 18. Uh, there is no any tuition fee. It is open to everyone. So children are not paying for going to Armut Labs and labs are into schools all around the country. Uh, but there is a mandatory point that uh, in villages, in this village schools, uh, there should be uh, not less than 30 children, like 30 pupils. So if uh, the number of the pupils in, in these schools is less than 30, it is not so expedient to open a lab in that school. That's why we, we are developing currently uh, uh, um, kind of a model where children can go to a nearest village so that to get that education uh, from the school that is the most near, the closest one to their community. Curriculum components. What do we have in curriculum? As I mentioned, it has been developed by our uh, education uh, committee, UAT Education Committee, which is uh, uh, which includes experts uh, from different kind of educational organizations. Um, so first is basic programming and animation where children are taught uh, the basic uh, programming um, uh, skills and know, uh, like uh, knowledge and the animation skills. We are using here is the program Scratch and it is um, translated into Armenian language. Uh, second is microcontroller programming and robotics. Third is 3D modeling. And fourth is UAV and control system systems. I will talk about them later on as well. So labs equipment, what, what do we use in um, 
with alongside with the curriculum. Uh, you, you can see mini computers. We call them um, uh, actually Bagrevant, set of robotic kits, uh, educational 3D printer, and CNC miling and laser potting machine. Again, these four uh, equipment are made in Armenia. Um, so the program Scratch, which is in Armenian Arves, Kadia, Aigestan, Berzor, FreeCAD, we use FreeCAD, CAD uh, and CAM, main platform for 3D design, and OpenSCAD, CAD and CAM, alternative 3D CAD and CAM platform. Um, so these are the main equipments and programs for ARMET laboratory methodology, the concept, and uh, um, yeah, equipment. So basic course, scratch and modified version of this, creation of the simple computer games, creation and using of animation, use the physics laws uh, in, with Korea, uh, which is TARTL uh, program, uh, uh, application of mathematical algorithms, um, uh, arithmetic calculations, visualization of the algorithmic tasks using mathematical formulas, and basic robotics, collection of simple robot constructor, programming of line following robot using uh, key turtle and Korea, which is again turtle programs for robots programming. Advanced course, this is the second stage of uh, of our uh, education, curriculum education. So after graduating these courses, uh, children are taught the advanced course, which is assembling of Sarah robots, connection to robots via PC, laptop, tablets, or smartphones, creation basic programs for robots using office and career that skills, already obtained from the first stages I mentioned before, making and programming robots, which will have a function to line tracking, find the sort of objects and avoid obstacle escaping, attacking. So in advanced course, children are doing much more um, uh, challenging tasks that are they are taught in the first stage. But uh, the most challenging, of course, is the expert course where children are just um, so involved with 3D pretty and CAC laser and drilling actions. So with 3D printing, modeling and printing by 3D printer, children like learn and discover the technical structure of the 3D printer. Uh, also you know, printing of model details, discovering the printing stages, creation of uh, CTL and G-code files for 3D printer, learning free CAD modeling program, etc. With CNC laser and drilling machine, uh, it is possible to learn uh, uh, Escape modeling program, uh, learn uh, Higgs CAD and Higgs CNC programs, learn as I uh, this all of pro, all of the programs that, that I mentioned here and creation details by drilling and laser cutting. Uh, maybe in the video you noticed all of this. Um, uh, materials uh, that uh, children used uh, for their works, uh, especially for the competitions, for the contests and camps that are um, accomplished during the ARMED program. Children like do their selves, uh, prepare the models their selves and for robotics as, as well, and present them uh, during uh, during these presentation stages. <clears throat> so, uh, what they learn? Uh, they learn how to write code by creating basic video games, uh, uh, the artificial intel intelligence, eyes open on uh, uh, opportunities in IT and engineering use the 3D printer to invent a new type of robot working with UAV and control system and understand their role in their own community. So these are the main outcomes that the children are having after, um, uh, during, not after, but during uh, passing these uh, courses in our mod. Uh, what is so important that alongside with the hard skills that are ch that children gain, uh, because it is totally programming and engineering, we put so much effort in this knowledge to to give them knowledge about hard skills. This like um, time is so children need to uh, be creative and. Uh, uh, 
to be able to create something but their own hands but uh, it is so important for them to also have these skills to present what they uh, create so that so it is an opportunity it is a challenge for us as an education organizers to um, help them to develop their soft skills as well uh, Honestly, we're having such a brilliant uh, children which create uh, some robots. But when you ask them, okay, uh, dear, can you explain what you and how you made it? And there is just silence, you know, but it is lack of these soft skills that we're facing. And uh, that's why it is so, so important uh, for, for us. And development of self-confidence, building a critical eye, development of creative creativity, personal initiative, teamwork. So I would put emphasizes in teamwork because it is a pro um, projective uh, education. And in our mod, uh, next to the um, one computer is used by two children it is mandatory that the computer needed in front of the computer two and more children need to work not one you know, so that we can develop this teamwork and adaptive um, adaptability taste of entrepreneurship intellectual agility open to change and innovation so these are all um, most most soft skills that we're uh, developing uh, for the children we're developing um, structure to put to invest uh, curriculum also for uh, for achieving these goals um, actually I can skip this part because I've already talked about it so what are our achievements uh, 47 percent of the armed alumni have been employed um, 84 of them armed alumni have been enrolled in universities mainly in the faculties of uh, um, kubernetes uh, it and mathematics physics etc mostly mostly stem however Currently, it is so uh, encouraging for us that uh, right now we are working together with our uh, Ministry of Education to include uh, our mod uh, into um, uh, standard standard uh, STEM, standards of STEM education for uh, public schools. So this process has already been launched and uh, Armat would play a significant role so that all of those children that are not included in Armat programs uh, during their studies with maybe, I don't know, um, technology or chemi uh, chemistry or biology uh, could do their uh, works in Armat laboratories as well. Um, so, yeah, this process has been started with the ministry and, um, yeah, here you can see that startup founders, we have 12% uh, of our alumni are uh, creating their own startups. In the video, you saw only four, four of them. And UAT as an organization is taking responsibility to help these uh, students to, um, to connect uh, the, their work STEM with all of these member organizations that we are having 127 so that to uh, up, uh, ensure their incubation uh, period. Uh, I have forgotten to tell also that the coaches are not coaches we have 527 coaches in all of the regions of Armenia. Uh, this the salary of the coaches are paid by the government. We could make this deal in 2017. Maybe that's uh, shortly. Shortly, that's all about our mod. Uh, but uh, I'm I'm open. The team is open to share more knowledge and more information about what we do and how we do it. And uh, I will uh, take this opportunity and would 
uh, invite especially all of those uh, people and the organizations that um, are already in robotics and 3D printing activities to participate in our contests because we have we're having uh, um, we are going to have a, an international robotics contest in August. So Merab, maybe I will uh, ask to share all of the contacts so that I can send the invitations for the participation. Okay. Thank you. I am open, uh, and the team is open for for future collaboration. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> it's really impressive. Um, I asked um, participants to write some questions in the chat, uh, but I also have a question. Um, somehow reflecting on the question in the chat before, not a question, probably a comment that the teacher um, teacher is important and if the teacher is motivated and it's if it's uh, leading the process so my question is how do you train um, what's the methodology how you make those teachers enthusiastic about teaching in your labs i mean in those 600 and more what's uh, your training program about mm -hmm. uh, we have separated uh, two main uh, roads let's say two main um, uh, yeah maybe projects also so first um, first of all they are trained all of the programs that they need to teach uh, and this period uh, these trainings are periodically every like three months four months they're again passing some tests it is periodic process you know it is not one-time process uh, so um and to, we we are responsible for like UAT is responsible for their trainings according to the curriculum. Later on or already, uh, we have created a committee, as I mentioned before, educational committee, which is responsible for um, for developing uh, training programs for coaches mm -hmm. and uh, not only um, not only. Uh, in the frames of ARMAT, but also again for uh, pedagogical, let's say, uh, approaches, because not every coach in ARMAT is a teacher, you know? So we are applying these pedagogical um, approaches as well so that they, they can get all of the pedagogical knowledge uh, in order to use uh, uh, with the work with children. So it is a periodical process, if I can answer to your question. Mm -hmm. with all, all of the curriculum that is developed over already five, six years. And another question, if there is any connection with um, vocational education. So you're mainly in uh, public general education schools, right? Uh, vacation, it is vocational actually, actually yeah. it, is, it is vocational. <laughs> you yourself vocational in a sense, but okay. Yeah, 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 non-formal non education. Currently, um, government is asking for, is it possible to make a formal, uh, part of the formal education? So it would be maybe so difficult actually, because uh, children are staying in the labs from let's say six to 10 to, to 11 and like, it is difficult to combine non-formal education with the formal education. So it is, we can say that it is vocational, somehow vocational also. Okay, thank you. And especially, um, yeah, well, the, they are young kids, so the uh, employment rates are still high, like 46%, because they don't go maybe immediately to the business. Uh, yeah. and the startup, uh, uh, when you asked about yeah. vocationally, now I got it about the college ages, mm -hmm. you mean, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, uh, unfortunately, this part is not so much developed yet. However, we have another program which is called Armat Plus, and so children can graduate from the uh, from let's say tenth year in uh, in Armenia. The secondary uh, school is from uh, five to nine. So vocational comes from nine till 12. So we are currently developing this ARMA plus program for especially vocational children. Okay. And the uh, turnover, yes, actually turnover of uh, this stage, the uh, vocational uh, for these children who are in the vocational stage is high. It is, uh, it is already seen that children who uh, visit our laboratories are from the age to, uh, from 10 to maybe 15, not more. After on, they are going to 
uh, just uh, study for the universities. That's why they skip coming to our math labs. Yeah, and it's actually <clears throat> matches the uh, research finding that if you manage to engage young people to STEM, it's like from 12 to 14, and later it's a bit more difficult. Yeah, it's a challenge, it's a challenge, yeah. Thanks a lot. We'll share all okay. your links and presentations and also try to think about engagement of our participants in your events and publicize it. Now, um, before I go to the next presenter, please, um, there is another question, contextual question on the same link, uh, which is about who should fund, who should support these initiatives, whether it's this national government or private sector or schools themselves or enthusiasts. So, Please answer again this slide a question, but it's a dif different one. And now our next presenter, um, Oksana Zadarozhna from Ukraine. Oksana, пожалуйста. Да, здравствуйте. К сожалению, у меня не работает камера. Greetings. Unfortunately, my camera is not working, but I really hope that you can hear me. Just a minute. I will share my screen and have my presentation on the screen. Can you see it? Is everything fine? Yes, everything is working. Thank you. I would like uh, to share our experience of aviation robotic systems um, at my educational institution, the Flight Academy of the National Aviation University. Uh, this year, uh, we will be celebrating our 17th anniversary, and we have come a long way to um, achieve um, what we have accomplished. We have uh, four majors. And within one major, aviation transportation, we have such a specialization as aviation robotic systems. It's a new discipline that we introduced several years ago. And we had very few entrants and our educational institution was even on the verge of closure. So we had to make some steps to offer something new to our students. And we wanted to move with the times and we wanted our education to be in line with the labor market needs. Hence, we decided to incorporate some distance disciplines uh, pertaining to aviation robotic uh, systems uh, and uh, UAV. In 2020, we created two centers, the Robotics Center and the UAV Center. These centers uh, operated based on some procured uh, robotic sets. Uh, for example, Lego Mindstorms, uh, five basic ones and four resource ones. We also purchased three sets of uh, Chatrix Mux in some practical electronics sets. As for the UAV center, it had some professional unmanned uh, aerial um, vehicles, Phantomus. We had a camera and remote control. Um, I will start with the UAV center, and then I will provide you with a more comprehensive overview of the robotics center. On this slide, you can see the main focus areas uh, of the UAV center. You can see everything on the screen, so I will not go into too much detail, but the main purpose is to train our students in the basics of operating unmanned aerial vehicles, um, how they can be used for search and rescue, how they can be used for agricultural purposes. Our UAV Center uh, tightly cooperates with the Ukrainian Association of Drone Racing. We invited their representatives to our institution. We organized some competitions and contests. And uh, at the bottom of the screen, you can see our um, airfield and you can see the equipment that we use for such competitions and contests. So basically we started promoting the sports uh, use of UAVs. We have another partner, the Save Us Drone Korean company, and this company specializes in um, agricultural uh, drones. So the purpose of this cooperation was uh, to um, create and design agricultural UAVs. We wanted to engage our students in 
into uh, research and development. And we also wanted to design and create uh, prototypes of agricultural UAVs. So for our region, um, it's very uh, relevant because uh, um, our region is agricultural in the first place. And a lot of agribusinesses have an avid interest in the application of UAVs. So the Save Us Drone company cooperated with us under their own grant program funded by their government. Unfortunately, uh, this program is over right now. So uh, we don't really have that cooperation anymore. Apart from that, within our academy, we also conduct some annual international scientific and practical workshops on UAVs. We closely cooperate with other research and educational institutions. Uh, we cooperate uh, with the police uh, and um, other governmental authorities. And now briefly about the robotics center. You can see the main focus area on the screen, uh, training and methodological work, research and development, uh, innovative developments and the popularization of uh, ro robotics. A lot of questions have been asked today and it has been mentioned several times that it's important to create uh, robo robotics uh, clubs and labs uh, in schools. So we believe that um, robotics is a, a very important component. In our schools in the region, we have some clubs that specialize in robotics and they have the necessary equipment, but unfortunately we have a shortage of professionals. Not all the teachers know how to um, train in such topics and not everyone is ready to shoulder this load. Uh, we've received some robotic sets, but uh, we had to build everything from ground zero. So we had the main teaching load, we had our major disciplines, and we had to design a completely new curriculum, a completely new discipline from scratch. And I'm very grateful to our colleagues from schools, from the Innovative Educational Solutions Company for their support for providing us with some sets and constructors. Their methodology experts uh, um, guided us in this process and we are very grateful for their guidance and advice. So I think the training and the methodological part of this pathway was the most challenging one. So we introduced two disciplines, basic robotics and programming of robotic systems. We teach the first discipline uh, using Lego Mindstorms, the EV3. As for the second discipline, we use Tetrix and Avina controller. The next three slides are dedicated to three modules from the uh, basic robotics discipline. I would like to mention here that usually the Lego Mindstorms constructor is used in school. So our most challenging task was to adapt this constructor to the teaching of uh, specialty subjects because we wanted this constructor to be of benefit and use to our students. So here you can see the first module, um, engines, um, cogwheels, uh, the second module, um, sensors, uh, um, infrared, um, ultrasound sensors, uh, temperature sounds, uh, sensors. The third module, a 3D modeling of robots with the use of several sensors at the same time. Each topic from each and every module is grounded in STEM methodology. On this slide, you can see an example of how we teach the operation of an engine. And we split this topic into all the components, science, technology, engineering, and math. 
here you can see the same split, but about manipulators. So once again, you can see this breakdown into the STEM methodology. So we designed a classical manipulator model with two links, and we tested the operation of this model with the help uh, of uh, um, modeling. So um, here you can see the model of this manipulator, and on the right, you can see the graphic representation. The students had to program uh, this manipulator. They had to program uh, how this manipulator grabs an item and moves it from point A to point B. Uh, the same is about uh, radar, um, um, ultrasound sensor, um, how we can visualize everything, how we can process all the data collected. So here you can see a video clip of the operation of this radar. So you have this ultrasound sensor, it's rotating. It's uh, collecting some information on any barriers or obstacles. And you can see the visualization on the screen. Now you can see an amplified version um, of the screen. The data is then transmitted to the relevant software. And from the software, we export everything into Excel and we can use Excel to visualize the collected data. Um, mechanical transmission, for example, uh, planetary reduction gearboxes, such gearboxes are used uh, for um, aircraft engines. On this slide, you can see some specific examples from the basic robotics discipline. The next discipline is the programming of robotic systems. I have already mentioned that uh, it's grounded in uh, Arduino hardware and Tetrix constructor. We have only three um, Tetrix sets. We don't really have that many students, uh, up to uh, five per class. Uh, unfortunately, we were not able to purchase um, Arduino, but uh, the program is there. We have to execute it. So the teaching staff um, chipped in to procure the hardware, the sensors, and this is the equipment that we use to teach our students. This course uh, follows the basic robotics course. And now students have an opportunity to use PRISM and the Arduino software. For PRISM, we have specially developed uh, libraries that are used for programming. What are some potentially interesting further focus areas? Uh, avionics, it's all about the creation of UAVs with the use of uh, robotic uh, um, details uh, and parts. So you create a UAV, but uh, you use some additional parts to monitor the external environment, to recognize some um, items. It's um, especially important uh, while taking off or landing. But uh, this is something that we want to tap into in the future because we have a shortage of human resources. So as you can see, we are doing our best to move with the times and explore new horizons. We also um, train students of small academy of sciences in robotics. They come to us, we give them some classes, they create their own projects, and then they participate in all Ukrainian competitions and contests. We also um, hold a wide array of competitions. So for example, uh, we have the selection tournament on robotics uh, within the first LEGO League international program. And we also um, give uh, robotics classes as part of continuing education for teachers. Uh, as for first LEGO League, I would like to note that uh, our academy cannot really hold such competitions uh, by itself because this competition implies enormous financial resources. As an academy, we cannot really finance the conduct of this large scale competition. Therefore, we created a standalone um, NGO and via this uh, NGO, 
we opened a bank account, we organized a, a fundraising campaign, and we started looking for sponsors. 12 teams from five regions. So we definitely had to recruit some additional funding to organize this major event. And this is the last slide of my presentation. We've had some staff changes. Um, our focus shifted a little bit. So we created this UAV center, the robotics center, but now they are a thing of the past. Uh, recently, our academy underwent um, res uh, underwent some restructuring and reorganization. Now we created a lab of uh, information uh, technologies. So we continue working in the area of robotics, but uh, such endeavors require partnerships and cooperation because it's all about experience sharing. It's all about cooperation uh, uh, between um, teachers. And we want to provide our students uh, with uh, um, more opportunities. There are a lot of different uh, types of robotics that are very interesting and we would like to integrate into the teaching process, but it all boils down to funding, to money. If you don't have the required uh, financial and material resources, it's extremely challenging and it's a up uphill battle to further develop all these technologies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Oksana. I don't see any questions in the chat, but I have a question to you. So uh, a student comes to you from a school or a VET institution. Do you work with schools and VET institutions somehow to attract more students to enter your academy? Definitely, this is our main task actually. Those young people who graduate from schools, need to be motivated to stay in Ukraine. We don't want them to leave and go abroad for studies. So we need to demonstrate that they can receive a high quality education and training at our institution, because this is the only way to prevent brain drain. We conducted this uh, robot racing competition. Uh, we used to go to schools, uh, to um, boarding schools, uh, because some of the school uh, schools have Lego constructors uh, um, for some for several years. Uh, there are local um, companies or communities that uh, provide some funding for schools. These schools are not many, but we visited them. We invited their representatives to our academy. And the final stage of the first Lago League was the invitation of uh, everyone interested. So we brought together about 1,500 kids together with their parents. It was a great opportunity for them to be exposed to robotics. So my point is that we bent over backwards to establish robust cooperation with schools because uh, their graduates are our potential future students. Uh, thank you. We have about 10 minutes left. Uh, let me show the findings of the poll and maybe you will have some more questions or comments. Any inputs are welcome. You touched upon the issue of funding. Who should support robotics and 3D printing and education? Most participants believe that national authorities should do that. They have to be interested in the first place because uh, that can provide for more sustainable funding. Partnerships, uh, projects. There are some international uh, projects and programs that might be interested in supporting robotics and 3D printing and education. You can find multiple links in the chat. Schools, of course, uh, private sector, nothing, and enthusiasts, uh, nothing. But I think with all large scale projects, uh, it usually starts with some enthusiasts. I mean, they are the first ones to take initiative and do something. Are there any other questions or inputs? But 
very concise ones. If yes, then please raise your hand, but we don't really have that much time left. So if there is anyone willing to contribute, if you haven't spoken yet, but you would like to share something, you have a great opportunity to do so right now. All right, I cannot really see anything. I guess it's because everyone is tired at the end of business. Then I have a question to you. Do you see potential links between 3D printing and robotics? You can print out a lot of things, uh, but maybe it's more convenient to use ready-made Lego constructors. But do you see any potential of using printed parts? I guess it's a question to our speakers in any other participants. Fabio, go ahead. Yes, another another piece of the question. Uh, I wonder how uh, replicable or transferable these practices are, because as you know, the the logic of these webinars is not only to hear from great experiences. And let me thank you all. Very inspiring. But if you can uh, provide a, a sentence or two on how others could implement uh, your uh, your uh, practices, I've seen we've seen that uh, government support should be key from the poll. But uh, if you have some ideas or if you have already tested uh, some transferability activity, that would be great to hear as well. Thanks. Well, I guess it's a question to our speakers in the first place. Can your experience be replicated or multiplied in other settings? and also try to touch upon my question. Can we establish some potential links between robotics and 3D printing? Um, let me give it a try. As for uh, Lego Mindstorms and uh, Tetrix, when you have some ready-made details, well, I think that we always need to start with hard and fast constructors because uh, children need to understand what assembling or constructing is. Then we can transition to the next stage, which is making. So making, maybe you can use a different set of microcontrollers, but if you want to create a mobile robot, you might have to use a completely different form of format, but this is the next stage in my opinion, much needed one. So I guess we just need to break it down into small steps. We start with the basics, the basics of algorithms, the basics of constructing. And then once you have the solid foundation, you can transition to the next stage, which is 3D modeling, 3D printing. And at this next stage, you can motivate kids to create something themselves. I believe that this way we will be able to yield the greatest effect. May I add something? would agree with Oksana. Uh, they use with robotics, I mean, with the robotic kit, they use the basics. However, for enhancing the robot in order to develop the model of the robot, the uh, design of the robot, they are uh, themselves creating different kind of um, parts of those robots uh, by 3D printers. So it is so complementary, but the basics need to be uh, done, uh, like need to be to have uh, uh, at first, then they can develop themselves whatever they want for that robot by 3D printer. Shaman, and can you uh, comment about transferability of uh, or shareability of your uh, project? So the model is different because uh, with Darbot, um, it is uh, it is free for all of the schools in Armenia. However, um, uh, with different uh, schools outside of Armenia, we are using the franchising model. We have uh, the uh, this especially special franchising packages, uh, three types of franchising packages: light, middle, and um, enterprise for all of those entities who would like to uh, implement our mod uh, model. Uh, 
you can go to our website and click to franchising and you will see what kind of uh, multiplication we are suggest suggesting uh, others outside of Armenia. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome. Uh, Yura, was good with commentary. Yuri, do you have any inputs? As an enthusiast or on behalf of enthusiasts? We have about three minutes left. Can you participate in one more poll? Your takeaway from the webinar? Be very succinct. What is your major takeaway from the webinar? Because uh, this will be useful food for thought. I don't really think we will have enough time to show the findings. Thank you very much for your active participation. Some of the participants and uh, speakers uh, are down with COVID. Uh, we were supposed to have more participants from Belarus. Uh, we have quite a few from Moldova. As I mentioned at the very outset, it's a regional project. In a week, my colleague uh, will conduct uh, yet another webinar. So just follow our uh, web page on Open Space. Uh, and um, if you sign up, then you will receive uh, any announcements, uh, uh, new webinars will be populated there. So please stay tuned. But this is not the end of the pathway for ETF. I'm 100% positive that uh, there will be many more interesting projects and initiatives uh, with your active participation and involvement in the future. So I would like to encourage all of you to contribute, to be actively engaged and share any innovative uh, projects and initiatives uh, that you are implementing. The Creating New Learning Initiative is a very interesting name, but it's not only about doing something, it's also about sharing, it's also about replicating. As startups say, you might not always uh, succeed, uh, but after the third, the fourth, or the fifth attempt, uh, you might have a success. So sometimes you might have to um, attract some funding from sponsors or private entities or maybe some international organizations, but I'm sure that if the will is there, you will be able to enlist required support. Thank you very much for your uh, participation. I don't really want to make any projections because um, it's a precarious time uh, for everyone globally, but uh, we can still um, converse and network uh, via Zoom. Uh, of course, it would be better to see everyone face to face. But anyway, thank you very much and thank you ETF for this great opportunity. See you soon. Bye bye. See you soon. Bye bye.